Grape fruits are a vital source of detoxification and cleansing for the body. And when we look at these different fruits like papaya, for example, this is a somewhat ripe papaya, right? And its lineage is about 12,000 to 15,000 years old. And so when you consider fruit DNA, there's a lot of information the fruits can communicate to us when we consume them. Coconut water is here for a particular reason, which will be explained a little bit later. But fruits are vital when we're talking about health, digestion, and the elevation of our being, right? So let's look at some of the ways that we can get fruits in a much more reliable way. So I had the opportunity to go to a farmer's market, right? And I found that there was grapefruit that you can get in bags. And it's not the first time that I bought grapefruit in a bag, right? The very first time I bought grapefruit in a bag was at Walmart many, many months ago. Actually, it was much earlier in 2023. And I was like, oh, bag of grapefruit, that, that's cool. But then after a while, I didn't see any more uh, grapefruit in a bag at Walmart. So it's like, you know, uh, grapefruit is really cool. And it's nice when you can find it in, in, in a quantity that, is much, that costs much less, that costs much less than what you normally see when you go to a certain mainstream um, you know, places for shopping, right? And so the grapefruit here is not 100% ripe, okay? But I found that grapefruit doesn't always have to be ripe in order to still give you benefits, right? But you watch for the darkening of the grapefruit. So it goes towards a darker orange, right? And one of the ways to uh, hasten the ripening of the grapefruit is to have quite a few of them clumped together like I do here. And, you know, you also want to clean them when you get them because I know people uh, say that uh, non-GMO and organic uh, fruits and vegetables don't really have to be cleaned the way that you have to clean uh, vegetables and fruits that have been exposed to pesticides and herbicides like glycosophate or atrazine, right? But I still clean them anyway. So these are all organic, right? And I just want them clean so that I can uh, trust, um, because a lot of hands have touched them, which is fine. That's part of the process. And they've been sitting in uh, staging areas where, you know, there's been an accumulation of debris and other elements, right? So cleaning is just a, a common sense thing to do. But uh, you also want the, the, um, the ability, or at least the option, to be able to bite right into it. Because sometimes there, there, there are cases where you just want to bite right into it. I mean, we don't always peel these grapefruits uh, in a refined fashion. So we might use our teeth to pull parts of it to, apart. Now, the papayas here, they're not as ripe as the papaya I showed you earlier. <clears throat> and at the time, I did not know the different ripening stages of papaya. So when I uh, got these... Um, I naively acquired them um, thinking that they're in, they're in a great um, sh uh, shape because they're green. But it turns out that they have to be yellow in order to be ripe. And something just told me to look, to look into that. So I did look into it. Um, I, I guess it's a little, little late, but better late than never. And so I found that one a way to try to hasten or speed up the ripening is to put them in a paper bag with a Granny Smith apple, and that's supposed to uh, help accelerate the ripening by at least three days. I did try that. That didn't work quite as well as what the Internet said it would. So it's like, okay, well, um, so those papaya, they're, they're still sitting uh, waiting for their chance to ripening. And I did put um, uh, two of them out in the sun um, you know, over a span of a few days to help accelerate the ripening and reacclimate them to nature. And that seems to have an, a positive effect on them. But papaya has that ancient DNA and they're great boosts for your body. <clears throat> Mini medules is something that I uh, discovered 
at the fresh market. And so these mini medules, um, they are a very convenient way to get your medules in a flavored way or your dates, right? And so uh, medule dates are a type of dates. You got deglet dates, you got callus dates, you got all kinds of different dates out there. Uh, medule dates are very common um, in the area uh, where I live. <clears throat> and so, or commonly sold in the area where I live. And you'll see that these have about five grams less sugar than your regular medule dates, right? And so that's just the minimal processing that's been applied to them where some of that sugar has been stripped off, right? And how often do you see that where you actually have a reduction in sugar? But make no mistake, this is still full-on date or date material, right? It's just that um, it doesn't have that outer skin that's typical of dates, right? And this one has the infusion of cacao powder and pecans, right? Pecan uh, uh, chunks, right? And then you got the uh, version of the mini medules, right? That is uh, has uh, coconut flakes on the outside. And those, those persons who I've uh, shared this with have told me that they like this better than the version with the cacao, right? Um, I like them both, right? And I think that the version with the coconut flakes is actually sweeter, right? And it does have um, four grams more uh, sugar than the cacao version, right? Which kind of explains that a bit. But I don't think that's the full story. I think that those coconut flakes add to it. And it has more of a caramel uh, taste to it as well. And I like to mix it with coconut milk because the coconut milk helps saturate it as well as regular uh, medjool dates, right? And they're just a great snack to have that you can mix with nut butters and a variety of other things to have a healthy, uh, natural snack that elevates, um, you know, your experiences throughout the day. And so coconut water is here because unbeknownst to me all this time is that coconuts are a type of fruit, right? And I think the confusion for me is that there's been some debate on what is coconut actually. Because if you look at the name cocoa nut, is it a nut? Is it a vegetable? Is it a fruit? What is it exactly, right? And so it's like, okay, um, it's, it's definitely a fruit. And so, and the thing about, about it being a fruit is that um, when I look back on my fasting that I did with um, coconut water, in a sense, I was doing a fruit-based fast just with a liquid that um, was in a much more refined form in terms of like, I didn't have to juice anything, right? The juice was already in the, already in the package like you see here. And so coconut water is a great, what, a great accompaniment to the consumption of regular fruits. It's a great way to saturate things like dates, and it's a great way to um, add flavor to certain meals, right? Because I wouldn't suggest cooking with coconut water, but I would, I would suggest that if you need to add some liquid to a meal after the fact or after it's cooked, it's a great, great thing to do. And then when you consume fruits like this grapefruit, and you consume a liquid like coconut water, you will find that the coconut water will actually amplify the beneficial properties of things like grapefruit or grapes or other astringents, right, that you may consume. I'm not sure that they actually enhance things like berries, right, like blueberries, but they do work well with the astringent citric fruits I found in my own experience, right? And so uh, coconut water is absolutely vital for those processes where you want to move things through. And of course, I like to add cacao powder, but I have this here for a very specific reason. I have been showing in my other videos uh, things like, uh, you know, Hershey's cacao powder, and I was mistaken in showing those. So I want to correct that mistake in that you want to use genuine cacao powder that has not been processed the way that baking cacao powder is, right? That uh, Hershey's dark chocolate uh, powder, cacao powder, it's processed. 
So it's processed in a way where it's not so it's not bad. It's just that it's processed in a way where a lot of the beneficial elements that you see here, like the vitamin D, the calcium, the iron, the potassium, the magnesium, and the vitamin C, as well as the polyphenols and the flavonoids and the antioxidants, they're greatly reduced in the baking version. So this is actual organic cacao powder, right, that has all of the true uh, ingredients and um, beneficial aspects that you get from cacao, right? So that's why you want to go this way. And these are persimmons. I never had per persimmons until about three weeks ago. And there's a couple of things about persimmons. If they're not ripe, they're absolutely horrible to, to taste. Absolutely. Um, they, they almost are like a, a drink, uh, consuming some rubbing alcohol, right? If you ever, uh, you know, had an encounter with rubbing alcohol, right? It, it, that's how they taste. It's the tannins. They taste extremely well when they're super ripe. That little black uh, bump there, that's a good indication that the ripening has moved along to the right level. So don't ever be afraid of bruises on fruits, right? Because they can be an indication of ripening, right? And even if you have a little bacteria that's kind of uh, invaded the fruit, right? Uh, that's fine. Just cut that part off and then eat the rest of the fruit. Because once the bacteria has made their way in, that means that, okay, that fruit is ready uh, for it's reached its maximum level. And speaking of fruit, this is tamarind. And tamarind, and if you hear some scream in the background, uh, that's my niece um, who is um, going through some growth right now. Um, so this is um, non-GMO tamarind that I found um, at, a, um, at a very special place. Um, that I'm going to talk about in a future video. Um, I've always wanted tamarind. I tried tamarind powder that I got off of Amazon, um, you know, last year, and it was absolutely horrible, right? Um, so at this um, this special health food store, um, it's actually more than that. I found some genuine tamarind. Tamarind's supposed to open the third eye or help facilitate that, should we say, as well as um, cranial decalcification and other benef beneficial aspects uh, besides. But I just wanted to try some in its natural form. And this is as close as I could get. Now, you can buy tamarind uh, straight up the fruit. Speaking of fruit, this is trifala powder. You got amla fruit, um, uh, bibitake fruit, and um, herbitake fruit. And for those that know about herataki as an element that helps in facilitating third eye pineal gland cleaning, um, herataki is actually a fruit. So the trifala powder um, is there. And of course, we can't forget apple cider vinegar. Apples is a fruit, right? And apple cider vinegar is a fruit juice that is fermented, right? It's a fermented fruit juice that helps you with various things uh, in your body, as well as a good uh uh, additive to uh, custom made dressings. So if you got olive oil, avocado oil, or something like that, or liquefied coconut oil, and you mix some apple cider vinegar with it, you can have a really great time with a salad. But fruits are absolutely <clears throat> vital because uh, Yaki Hickman is, um, has made um, a, a, a great case for the consumption of fruits. So Yaki at his website, yakiawaken.com, right? And you can find him on YouTube. He has some absolutely phenomenal uh, videos on YouTube. I wasn't convinced that fruits was a good way to build health. I wasn't. I was a fruit doubter up until last month, like 100%. Like I've used it in a fast before and I've used it here and there. And I've kind of oscillated or gone up and down in my embrace of fruits. But Yaki has convinced me. And so I've tried it. And I found that you can cleanse through fruits. And the consumption of fruits, especially if you mono diet on them, can do more than vegetables to actually take you further from a health standpoint. And so what I do is I do, uh, I have days where all I eat is fruits. And I don't do this every day, but there are days where I will consume up to six grapefruits, three at the first part of the day and three at the latter part of the day, right? And if I'm in a hurry 
at the beginning part of the day, I might go for an apple because apples are easier to consume than grapefruits because grapefruits, you got to, even if you take the speed method where you cut it in quarters and then you can peel it like that, right? Even then, that just takes a little bit more time than picking up an apple, eating right into it and going at it that way. But fruits give you the most energy. I think what, if I quote Yaki uh, correctly, is that uh, 12 angstroms of energy that you can get from um, you can get from fruits, 12 angstroms of energy, and somewhere in that ballpark. And so um, you get more energy from fruits than you can get from vegetables. And of course, vegetables have more energy that it can impart to you more than uh, meat, right? And so fruits are going to be the number one way to address all of the health factors in the human body, in the human body. So to address all the health factors in the human body, you can fast on fruits. And I haven't done that, right? I don't consider my, my, my single days of eating just fruits to be like a fasting regimen, right? Because the next day I'm going to eat vegetables, right? So it's a day on, a day off, a day on, a day off in some cases, right? But there have been stories from Yaki and others that there have been people who have fasted on uh, fruits for uh, 60 days, 90 days, and 140 days and have seen tremendous health outcomes from that regimen. I may try that at some point. I haven't decided. Um, but I do know at this point that having them as a bigger part of my dietary profile is actually showing great results because I will say that when I excluded fruits um, about two months ago, when I excluded fruits, and then when I uh, started eating again, right after doing a fast, and then I did just vegetables and beans, right, I could say that doing uh, that wasn't really as beneficial than than I saw when uh, that day that I actually had my first fruit after like four months or so, right? And so once I did that, things actually took off at a, a very good clip and, you know, I couldn't be happier for it. I've said a number of things during this discussion and I wanted to now um, make reference to where some of these thoughts have come from. So there's this gentleman named Yaki Hickman, otherwise known as Yaki Awaken. And on his website, yakiawakened.com, he has a great section under education where he breaks down some of these ideas in a very simple form, right? Eat very accessible because I'm a visual person. I like things to be visual. I do read a lot of books, but contrary to popular perception, I don't retain um, even half of what I read. I like it visual. This fruit tax law of 1893... And uh, the Tariff Act of 1883, that's when uh, the definition of fruit got changed for a lot of different things. So a lot of different vegetables that people call vegetables are actually fruits, right? So anyway, it's important because the way you combine food when you're eating it is important to your digestion. Go back to some of the videos I've, I posted earlier. Digestion is the cornerstone. It's the foundation for making sure that you get what you're trying to get from food, energy, uh, building of the body, cleansing, and revitalization, right? And so this is the cycle, digestion, absorption, utilization, and elimination. And so you can go to his website, yakiawaken.com, click on education, and then eat to live, and it will break all of that down. He also has downloads of these different um, documents where you can download um, like a two page or four page, um, you know, uh, breakdown of this. This is my favorite part. I love this part. And this is where I was inspired to do this discussion because I've put this into practice and I've even put it in practice before I even know what was happening. Astringents, antioxidants and phytonutrients or what I call detoxifiers, oxygen oxygenators and uh, builders, right? So detoxifiers, those are your, your citric, citric fruits like grapes and grapefruits. And then your uh, oxygenators, 
those are your blueberries, blackberries, cherries, and all of that. And then your builders, those are all your melons. Cucumber is a melon. You just peel the skin and you eat the cucumber because your body doesn't digest the, uh, the, the skin, the cellulose on the cucumber properly. Um, notice the footnote, always eat melons by themselves. And papaya is listed as a melon. Uh, growing up, I didn't really like melons. So if I was going to try melons again, because I didn't, really wasn't a fan of watermelon either. But that was probably just the candida in my gut talking. You know, can't your the bacteria in your gut, the bad bacteria can influence your body just as much as the um, the, the the bacteria that's good. So you got mucus forming foods out there, and I did not know that some of the things that I enjoy are mucus forming. So I was like, okay, I threw my hands up. I was like, you know, what in the world? But then I was like, okay, it kind of makes sense. Because the healthiest thing that goes in your body is fruits, water, and, and liquid derivatives like that, okay? Those are the healthiest things that go into your body. Anything else, the body's going to have to work hard to actually work with. And it just may be that some of these elements, like nuts, for example, they're just not really made for the human body. Even though the human body can work with it to some extent, not everybody's body including mine, work productively with all variety of nuts, right? Okay, and that includes beans, right? There are some beans that I know for sure I'm allergic to. I'm allergic to certain beans, and there are certain beans I, I dare not go near. Um, unless they're like cooked in a certain way, right? Then I can probably deal with them, right? And then um, you got your starchy vegetables. So some vegetables you need to cook carefully, and then some vegetables you dare not cook, right? You, you just got to know the difference. But the safest thing to eat is fruits if, you're, if your uh, body is at a certain level, right? Because some people, they can't even eat fruits, right? It's true. Some people can't even eat vegetables. It's true. But for those who's adapted to the vegetables and the fruits, then you'll want to stick with the vegetables. I'm sorry, with the fruits. Because fruits are going to give you the, the most impact, positive impact you can imagine. Now we get to the part that um, we talk about where is my diet uh, journey led me, right? So over the past two or three years, I've been trying to get my diet to the right level. And I can say that I've reached that point, right? So I've looked at various people like Eris Latham. He was kind of like my biggest push um, three years ago, Eris Latham. And then I, um, you know, encountered some good advice from people like um, Sadhguru, uh, Dr. Eric Berg, Dr. Stan Eckberg. And over time, it just evolved as I tried things and see which things worked with me, which things delivered the things that I was looking for. And then um, I finally just um, encountered Yaki Awaken. And so um, of all the people that I've looked at, right, um, and I also um, uh, take, take counsel from uh, Dr. Bobby Price, right? But out of all the um, advice I've seen out there, the one that I struggled with the most was Yaki Awaken. Because I was like, there is no way. There is no way fruit can have this kind of benefit to you. There is absolutely no way until I tried it. See, the thing is, um, you, you can try to work off of your intellect. You can try to work off of your read elect or what you've read and what you can recite, right? But experience is the trump card. Exper there's nothing greater than experience. Nothing in this universe, the cosmos, all of consciousness, you name it. We talk about vibration, frequency, energy, transformation, ascension, you name it. Nothing outweighs experience. Nothing is more true than genuine experience. Okay? So, I tried fruits. I actually tried it, I think I started trying it about four weeks ago, maybe a little bit before that. And then it was like, okay, let me just try a day of just mono diet. Let me try just eating just grapefruits. And the results for me was, was immediate in terms of what I could see in my body uh, the day following, right? And so I was like, okay, there's something to this. Now, I did do a five-day fast with just um, grapefruit juice, 
right? I did do that. And so I went five days back in February of 2023 with just grapefruit juice. But I will say that, um, you know, uh, doing it that way wasn't the same as eating grapefruits, right? Okay. Um, I struggled more with just doing grapefruit juice, right, than actually eating grapefruits. And so when I ate grapefruits, right, um, uh, here recently, I saw a bigger impact. A more positive impact. So this is kind of my diet out of a, out of a lot of trial and error over the last three years. This is what I've arrived at, and this is based off all. This is based on what's available um, on planet Earth, and this is uh, based on what um, both science and the naturopaths, right? So you got the allopaths, the naturopaths, and the homeopaths, right? And when you take the cross section of all these different groups of people and their advice, and then when you use your own experience to try these things out, this is what I found out for me. Now, everybody's body is different. So this isn't advice for everyone, but this is the path that I've, I followed that I found to be beneficial. So the core of my diet is shifting towards fruits. That's still a work in progress, right? That's more of a mental thing than anything, right? because I still lean towards vegetables, right? It's just that I've seen an aspect of vegetables where I can see where there are issues there where you go all vegetables, right? And it makes more sense when we look at the um, the, the Tax Act of 1883, right? Then that kind of changes things a little bit, okay? But I'll, more on that in just a moment. So for vegetables, let's just look at those as a group. In the vegetable area, I will emphasize soft greens and cruciferous vegetables, right? So when I say soft greens, I mean things like uh, chard, mizuna chard, um, maybe um, spinach, right? Um, your mixed greens, right? So your red leaf lettuce, um, your radicchio, uh, uh, greens like that, that you can just eat directly and you don't have to cook them. You don't have to heat them up. You don't have to do anything. You can straight eat those, those soft greens. And there are no issues for the most part, right? Okay. Um, I contrast that with hard greens, things like collard greens, where you have to soak them and you have to cook them, um, you know, uh, for a good minute in order for them to be uh, digestible by the body, right? Uh, kale is almost in that category, uh, not quite, but almost, right? And so, um, so I prefer the soft greens because I want things that I, I want things to, that I eat to be readily digestible, right? So that's the criteria. It's not about taste or texture or anything like that, right? Because we can solve taste and texture with collard greens and uh, heavier greens like that, okay? But how digestible is that? And how much effort do you have to put in to get that digestibility, okay? So soft greens, and then cruciferous vegetables. Now, cruciferous vegetables are not quite as um, readily uh, eat, uh, read, readily um, uh, edible as soft greens, right? Okay, so if you try to just eat straight cabbage without cooking it, there can be some, some challenges there. If you try to just eat uh, raw broccoli, I, some people can do it, but I'm not one of those people that I find raw broccoli um, enjoyable. I like mine a little steamed, okay? But the thing about cruciferous vegetables, especially, um, let's let's talk about uh, what do they call them, uh, brassicaris or something like that. But anyway, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, and let's see, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, and I'm I'm missing one other. Um, they're all derived from the mustard seed. They all come from mustard seed. So you got this mustard seed that helped produce cauliflower, broccoli, kale, and cabbage. That's the fourth one. So yes, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and um, and kale, they all come from mustard seed. So those, those uh, cruciferous vegetables are going to give you a huge benefit biologically. Then you got the green herbs. So I got these three in bold because they're they're actually, in my opinion, in my view, more important than the soft greens and the cruciferous. 
okay? Because you can use these with everything else that is shown on this screen, okay? So your green herbs, and I'm talking about cilantro, thyme, parsley, basils, those little, tight, little tiny greens, right, that you can just chop up and put them in a variety of things and eat them raw or eat them. They're, you could say they're kind of like soft greens, but they go further than your soft greens in that they are known uh, for their medicinal and health um, uh, factors in terms of what you can use them for, right? Same with root herbs. Root herbs, those are like your, they're like your uh, garlic, your onions. Those are your hard ones like uh, ginger root, turmeric root, right? Radishes, those root herbs, you can use them in cooking and you're still going to be okay cooking those or you can use them raw. If you use them raw in the right way, they have that same medicinal aspect to it. And then you got your seeds, like your sesame seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, they have an abundance of uh, biological beneficial aspects to them. And if you were to combine these three together, right, you could get a very potent effect in terms of your biology if you knew what you were doing in terms of combining them, right? And so the soft greens and the cruciferous, that's more for eating, right? You know, if you're looking to, to uh, create a meal or kick up a meal, that's kind of what your soft greens and cruciferous uh, are. And you can actually live without those. You really can. But you find more benefit from your green herbs, your root herbs, and your seeds, right? So then I go down to nut milks, right? So I got almond milk on here, but I really don't um, uh, dig almond milk so much. But I will tolerate it, you know, if, if, I, if I have to. I like it um, when it's like in these mixed shakes, like from Remedy Organics. They use almond milk very well. And then you got macadamia milk, which has um, a good uh, health profile to it as well. But my favorite here is coconut milk. And so I use coconut milk in a variety of ways. I cook with it. I simmer with it. I use it mixed with coconut water to create a nice uh, chocolatey type of uh, uh, drink. I um, actually use it to soak dates, right? It does a great job in soaking dates and helping uh, you to uh, eat dates in a, in a, night, in a more uh, texture-friendly way. And so coconut milk is absolutely phenomenal, right? I think uh, milk is a misnomer uh, for uh, many of these uh, ingredients here. They should have been called something else, right? Because I see coconut milk is just a form of coconut water that has a little bit more cream in it, right? And so then let's go across to legumes, what some people also call beans, right? And the thing about legumes is that they um, have aspects to them that don't work well for a lot of people, right? Phytic acid being among them, right? Know that when you sprout your beans that you've guaranteed that the phytic acid gets gone and at the same time, they are they have the same condition as uh, soaked beans that you would use in normal cooking. When it comes to soaking, I like my beans to be heavily soaked. And what I mean by that is sometimes uh, you, you might see recipes where you soaked your beans for four hours prior to cooking. I like to soak mine for um, uh, eight hours uh, times two, so over two days. So day one, soak for eight hours. Day two, drain that water, soak it again for another eight hours. So by the time I drain it that second time, it is fully and thoroughly soaked. And what you get out of that as a benefit is that all that phytic acid is gone. Because I've seen instances where you soaked it once and you drain it. And then if you do that soaking again, there's still some more phytic acid that has to be released, right? So it didn't all get gone out of that first soaking, right? And then um, I lean towards non-allergenic Aller, uh, allergenic varieties of beans, right? Because like I said, there's some beans that I'm allergic to. There's some beans I won't even touch, even in a sprouted version, right? Um, I'm just that careful with them. Same with nuts. There's some nuts that I don't uh, 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 jive with. Um, I won't say they break me out, but you know they, they definitely don't work well with my system. So that's just through trial and error. And then up at the top right, look at these oils, right? And so uh, these are the three oils that I deal with, right? The, uh, the avocado oil is great for high heat cooking, but I try not to do high heat cooking, right? High heat cooking, in my opinion, is for certain types of recipes. It's also for when you're in a hurry, 
right? So if you're not in a hurry, I find that coconut oil is absolutely um, uh, useful. And if you're cooking on low, let's say that your your burner goes from um, low to two to three to four to five for medium to six to medium high and then seven and then eight and then high. OK. OK. So let's say from zero so from one to ten. So what do I set it on? I try to set it on two. And you're like, you can't cook on two. Oh, yes, you can. If you let that uh, pot sit there, okay, with the lid on it, on two for like five minutes, that pot is hot. That pot is hot. But it's not so hot that it's going to burn the food or burn the spices or denature the coconut oil or the olive oil. So you can actually safely cook with coconut or olive oil if you are patient and you can cook on um, the two setting, maybe the three setting or below, right? So anywhere from one to uh, three on a, on a typical burner, if you can cook at that, at that uh, rate, then you're good with using coconut oil and olive oil. Mycelium, right? The mycelium network. You got shiitake mushrooms, button mushrooms, lion mane's mushroom, trumpet mushrooms. Those are just examples. But I find that mushrooms, if you wash them properly and then wash them in spring water, not tap water, right? Just take a, a Ziploc bag, pour some uh, spring water in there and, and put your cut mushrooms in there or uncut mushrooms, whatever you want. Close the Ziploc bag or the re resealable plastic bag, shake it up, shake off that residue, drain it. And then you just let it sit in the refrigerator. Then that excess moisture will actually disappear by uh, the next day. And then the mushrooms are in a good state for you to cook with, right? And so, uh, but mushrooms are great for prebiotic uh, interactions with uh, the gut uh, microbiome. And so you can actually generate good um, uh, gut bacteria and, and good uh, gut uh, elements, right, with the uh, mushrooms. So that's why I'm a fan of those, right? And then down below, you, I try to minimize grains, because grains are, are known to uh, be a great source of carbonic acids that the body does, doesn't do well with or some bodies don't do well with, right? And so I do okay with grains, but I know that if I do too many of those and I do it in the wrong way, that I, I do have issues with my body with that. I try to avoid high heat cooking, right? I leave that to the experts. I can do high heat cooking, but it just depends on what it is, right? But most of the time, I go the totally opposite direction, and I strive for low heat cooking and simmering. You know, if it's, if it's beans, I try to simmer the beans over an hour or more, even if I got them sprouted and so forth. Nut butters, I love almond nut butter, and that's something I discovered recently. But I also discovered that um, it helps uh, reduce my defenses in my body if I uh, combine that with uh, sugars from dates and that sort of thing. And so I had a recent experience with that, which is one of the reasons why I was off of YouTube for a while. Um, but then I was able to use herbalism and alchemy and this other kind of homeopathic process to actually uh, reverse that and clear that up. But it was a good lesson for me, you know, because I do experiment on my body and I like to try out things, even though I can see down the line that it's going to be an issue just to uh, build up my own wisdom through experience. But I minimize my exposure to carbonic and phytic acids and, um, you know, other non-beneficial acids in general. And so, you know, that that's just something that I, I try to minimize as, as much as I can. And I definitely avoid, and when I say avoid, I'm using a, a much more gentle, gentle uh, phrasing there. No processed sugar whatsoever. I don't want any, I don't touch that with a, uh, not even a five foot pole, a million foot pole, right? Just don't touch it. Processed oil is the same. Stay far, far away from that, right? I'm successful in being able to have a 99% um, um, uh, removal of processed sugars from my diet, but I would say I'm about um, 90 percent um, successful with processed oils. My exposure to processed oils generally comes in a form of when I go out and eat, right? Which I would say, I, if I do go out to eat, it's probably once a week now, and so I've greatly reduced going out to eat because I cook a lot more now, and so um, 90 percent plus of my meals 
are either cooked or fruits, right? And so I avoid the restaurants and by extension, I avoid the processed oils that's, um, you know, uh, in a lot of those foods. I, I avoid genetically modified food and I say avoid because you can't avoid 100% if you're eating out. But if you're buying your own produce and you're in a store, you look for the barcode that starts with the number four, right? If it's a number four, right, then that means that it went through the normal herbicide, pesticide, fertilizer process that's going to have some of those ingredients in it. And, you know, genetically modified produce needs those herbicides and pesticides because uh, genetically modified uh, produce, fruits and vegetables, don't have natural defenses like true organic uh, fruits and vegetables do because organic fruits and vegetables have evolved defenses, right? They're not 100%. Right. But, you know, their defenses are there, which is a good indication of their um, their organic state. And I definitely avoid isolated chemistry. Isolated chemistry is where you take uh, vitamin supplements and you're trying to uh, you make up for deficiencies um, due to um, not getting the right type of food and the right type of elements into your body in the first place. Right. And so because of a dietary choices, right, it's like, oh, I need a vitamin A supplement or a B12 supplement or a D supplement and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, OK, that's isolated chemistry. That is a a those are those are elements that been, that have been extracted from nature and in and put into a, a very separate form and then combined with petroleum right in the form of a pill so that you can now have um a, 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 you know, exposure uh, to those minerals and to those, those elements, but it doesn't work the same as when you get it from food. It doesn't work the same, okay? Because it's all about the geometry of the elements, right? Okay? And so if you get the geometry wrong, right, the body recognizes that and it just deals with it differently. And in many cases, it does not deal with it in an optimal way, Compared to when you access those same elements in natural foods, because the body has co-evolved with the general nature outside so that it instantly recognizes those geometrical uh, constructions from nature so that it um, absorbs those, those elements uh, properly. But the main thing that I'm, I'm looking at in my diet now is to... Um, enhance my access with fruits. And notice I put bell pepper, squash, and cucumbers, right? Well, if you look at the uh, Fruit Act of, uh, Fruit Tax Act of 1883, if I got the year right, uh, that was uh, an act where they were trying to reclassify cer- certain fruits as vegetables so they wouldn't, so cer- some people wouldn't have to pay taxes on the import of certain fruits, so when these fruits get imported, they're actually classified as vegetables. They call them vegetables instead of calling them fruits, so they won't have to pay taxes on them. And, you know, um, so anyway, bell peppers, squash, cucumbers, their type. How can you tell if it's a fruit? It has seeds in it. The majority of the fruits, nearly all of them, nearly 100% of uh, fruits have seeds in them, right? Okay. And so it's like, um, yeah, so when you cut open a bell pepper, you see a whole bunch of seeds. You cut open up a, a squash, you're going to see some seeds at some point. Cucumbers the same. All right. So I call them the non-sweet fruits, right? It was a very clever reclassification because it's like you, you, you chose the, uh, the fruits that were not sweet to be classified as vegetables, which actually kind of passed the the outer observation test, right? But in reality, they're, they're fruits. So it's actually a lot of foods are fruits that um, you think it's something else, okay? Um, including beans, all right? And then, um, but uh, astringents, a.k.a. citric, uh, oxidizers, a.k.a. Ber- berries, builders, a.k.a. melons, going back to Yaki Awaken, right? So those are three classifications I go with. I, I use the classification system he has, he has set up, and I found it to be reliable in terms of what it delivers for the body. And so uh, my main one is the astringents, because I think 
uh, staying in a regular uh, state of detoxification is actually vital to health, right? And so this is my overall health uh, approach, health plan when it comes to um, a diet. And so, you know, there's quite a bit of information here, but the main takeaway is you can't go wrong if you're able to, uh, to go with fruits and then a little bit of the vegetables, right? Putting more of an emphasis on the green herbs, the root herbs and the seeds, right? And then you can use the, the nut milks, but they're not absolutely vital, but they're, they're a good way to move the herbs and the seeds and the greens through the system, right? That's really the, the best function for the coconut milk, for example, or the almond milk. And then the beans, you can absolutely get rid of those, right? But if you're going to do them, do them the right way, sprouted or heavily soaked so that you don't get a blowback from them. And then if you want to really build up your gut, the mycelium over here is a really great way to do that. You don't need these oils, but if you're going to use oils, then it's best to use these because they're going to help you with either uh, carefully cooking the vegetables over here, as well as maybe adding some treatment to the beans, uh, depending on the recipe or the mushrooms, if you decide to cook them right. And they can also be useful with the soft greens, right? If you're going to uh, try to, uh, you know, make the soft greens more palatable for those of us that don't like uh, the taste of soft greens without the addition of oils on them, right? And so that's basically uh, what the overall thing is. Himalayan pink salt, Celtic salt, Redmond salt, those are all good ways uh, to go in terms of salt, right? And then your spices, you want to um, use your, your, your spices, especially turmeric, ginger, cumin, and cardamom, right? Those four. Those four will give you the biggest boost out of everything. Uh, look at my uh, other video on the Indian uh, uh, food and health uh, ingredients. Um, that one will break more of that down. But as far as uh, having a, a healthy outlook or healthy uh, approach, uh, this here is a good map to start with. And then um, the best way to refine this for those that want to take this to the next level is what can you subtract from this, right? Because this is a lot, right? The more you can subtract from this, the healthier you're going to be. So if you're going to subtract from this, what I would suggest is you want to keep the focus in terms of diet. And this is just what I'm looking at for my own future the, the focus should be on fruits. That's the number one focus. And then you supplement with the green herbs, the root herbs, and the seeds, right? And then you can also put in a little mushrooms, and then that's it. If you really want to simplify this down, fruits, herbs, seeds, and mushrooms is really the way you would go with that, okay? But some of us, we're still uh, in, a, in a habit cycle, including myself. I'm just refining that where we're still trying to do salads, and we're still trying to do some broccoli that's steamed and this kind of thing. And we like the, the taste of liquids, right? So that's where the coconut milk comes in and the oils and that sort of thing, right? And we like textures and that's where the beans come in, right? Okay, but yeah, if you subtract a lot of that out and you just do fruits, herbs, seeds, and mushrooms, you basically got it covered. So I hope you found this uh, uh, insightful. And um, I am starting to cycle down some of the content of this nature that I am uh, putting out there um, because, you know, uh, things are changing in the world. And so um, as I reach um, uh, conclusions on this sort of thing, then, you know, I'm not going to uh, stretch this out too, too long in terms of content. Um, you know, once I uh, say, OK, I, I, I've reached it, then that's all I got to say about it. So I might have a little bit more to say in the near future, but this is pretty much what I've been striving for. And uh, I hope you um, enjoyed this as much as I did. And um, I will see you in the next one.